Uh, but one of the things that we have tried to keep track of here on this show is um, who works at the White House? This administration is 328 days old. In that time, there have been an unusually large number of people uh, who have turned over, who have served in the Trump White House for some time, some of them in very senior roles, but then they either got fired or they chose to leave for some reason or another. And I'm sure that we have missed some. Uh, but just in terms of high-profile jobs, we have tried to keep just sort of a running tally of significant, notable officials who have fled or been fired from the Trump White House. Um, the vice president's chief of staff, for example, has left, as has the White House chief of staff, as has the deputy White House chief of staff, as has the first White House communications director and the second White House communications director and the White House press secretary and the assistant White House press secretary and the vice president's press secretary and the national security advisor, famously. Also the deputy national security advisor, the deputy chief of staff on the National Security Council, the head of intelligence on the National Security Council, the head of the Office of Government Ethics, the White House chief strategist, the White House chief strategist deputy, the special advisor to the president on regulatory reform. Hi, Carl. Also that deputy assistant to the president who goes on Fox News all the time and seemed to be very important, but nobody really knew what he did. And then we found out he couldn't get a security clearance. He left too. And also the secretary of health and human services, he left. I mean, that's not even counting the high-profile law enforcement people who have been flung out, like Acting Attorney General Sally Yates and the FBI Director James Comey and the dozens of U.S. attorneys who they fired on no notice, get out tonight by midnight. I mean, it's a very long list of people who have served in pretty significant roles who are already gone. Well, this week we got two more names to add to that list. Uh, one of whom got a lot of media attention for her departure. Her name is Omarosa Manigault Newman. Um, her title, I looked it up, was that she was the communications director for the Office of Public Liaison, which actually reminds me, the director of the Office of Public Liaison, that's another person who, that's another person who left. Can we add that guy to the list too? Yes, thank you. Uh, his name is George Zafakis, I'm told. Anyway, uh, Mrs. Uh, Menegalt Newman, she was the communications director for the Office of Public Liaison, which is not a high-profile office, let alone is that a high-profile job in that office. Uh, the beef with her among White House reporters is that nobody was ever quite sure exactly what she did at all. But she is personally a high-profile person because of her reality show career. So her departure this week has... has uh, attracted a lot of attention. But there's been one other departure from the White House this week that has attracted comparatively very little attention. But it's for somebody with a much bigger job. Her name is Dina Powell. Uh, immediately before her appointment to the White House, she was working at Goldman Sachs. Gary Cohn, the president's chief economic advisor, was previously the president of Goldman Sachs. So when Dina, Dina Powell came on board, it was thought that maybe she'd be in, in Gary Cohn's orbit. But where she actually ended up was at the National Security Council. She was named the Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategy. And in that role, a lot of normal Republicans, forgive me, or even like never Trump Republicans, they put faith in her, thinking she might be a potentially moderating influence in the administration more broadly, but in, in the National Security Council specifically. And the National Security Council and national security policymaking in this administration, it has been of particular concern. Remember that the National Security Council initially was set up by Mike Flynn. And we all know how well that worked out. And remember, after Flynn got appointed, after Flynn being appointed national security advisor, the next shudder of fear that went through national security circles was when Trump campaign CEO and White House senior, the, the, the Trump campaign CEO and White House senior strategist uh, arranged to get himself a seat on the National Security Council as well. Remember that? People were like, really? Steve Bannon has a permanent seat on the National Security Council? This is a guy who runs a right-wing website? and makes movies about how the Duck Dynasty guy looks just like Jesus. I mean, really? Permanent seat on the National Security Council? Are you sure? Alongside Michael Flynn running it? I mean, I don't mean to pick on Mr. Bannon. I know he has had a bad week. Alabama was as much his humiliation as it was the president's. Remember, the whole point of Bannon stoking the Roy Moore candidacy was to flex his Steve Bannon muscles and prepare the country for his global domination plan where he was going to run primary challengers against every single sitting Republican senator, just like he did with Roy Moore. Well, given how that worked out, the only people who may want to pay Steve Bannon to enact that plan now are probably Democrats. 
So Steve Bannon is having a, a bad week. You know, and everybody thought he might be this fearsome specter in Trump era politics in some kind of continuing way. But, you know, if you think about it, before this disastrous failure he's had in Alabama this week, really the last big round of attention he got was when he was fired from the White House. Before that, it was the time he was fired, not from the White House, but from the National Security Council. Remember, first they demoted him off the National Security Council. Then they fired him from the White House. Flynn and Bannon were such a weird idea for the National Security Council, the both of them. I mean, Flynn ended up resigning in the Russia scandal for things that ultimately resulted in him pleading guilty. Now he's looking at a potential prison sentence and is a cooperating witness with the Mueller investigation. Bannon left not that long thereafter. But those guys had really set, really set up the National Security Council in the first place. And once they were gone, it raised the question of what would happen to the wackadoos they had installed. Forgive me. It's not kind. What would happen to the eccentrics <laughs> that they had installed? The oddballs. What, what would happen to the free thinkers they had installed at very senior level, levels of the National Security Council, which is a very important thing? And in particular, when it came to Dina Powell, there was a lot of speculation that on the National Security Council, she might replace this guy. Dina Powell's title was Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategy. His title was Deputy Assistant for the President for Strategic Planning, right? I mean, come on, in Husker Du, those two are a match. That would be like if I came to work every day and I was the host of The Rachel Maddow Show, but there was somebody else on staff in an equally senior position who was the host of Rachel Maddow's show, right? But basically, we had the same job. I would expect that there'd be a fight to the death and only one of us was going to keep that job in the long run. And so Dina Powell was expected to replace this man, Kevin Harrington, who was one of the original, let's call him free thinkers, who was installed in a very important national security position back when Steve Bannon and Mike Flynn were in charge of that sort of thing. He came to this very senior job at the National Security Council with zero experience in foreign policy. Zero. Now he's supposed to be directing strategy for national security for the United States of America? Never worked in foreign policy a day in his life. However, he had worked at one of Peter Thiel's hedge funds. Peter Thiel, the eccentric, anti-democracy, German-born billionaire who made his money at PayPal, who famously bankrupted the Gawker website for, putting, uh, for printing things about him he did not like. This guy in this senior job at the National Security Council, his work experience for running strategy at the National Security Council was that he had worked at a Peter Thiel hedge fund. And before that... He had worked at a different Peter Thiel hedge fund. Well, this week we learned that not only did Dina Powell not end up replacing him, she is now leaving the administration. And he is still at the National Security Council. And we know that in part because the Washington Post reports today in this remarkable, epic, 50-source story that he, Kevin Harrington, is one of the pro-Russia officials remaining in the White House who actually supports President Trump's compulsive submissiveness toward Russia and toward Putin in particular. Uh, for Kevin Harrington, though, his motivation for his pro-Russia positions um, is reportedly a little... It's free-thinking? Is that the word we're using? Idiosyncratic. Let's call it that. Quote, Kevin Harrington, a former associate of Silicon Valley billionaire Peter Thiel, brought in to shape national security strategy saw close ties with oil and gas rich Russia as critical to surviving an energy apocalypse. A fate that officials who worked with him said he discussed frequently and that he depicted as inevitable. I can't believe this guy is still there. I remember being amazed at some of the Peter Thiel people who were being considered for high-level Trump administration jobs at the beginning. Remember they were reportedly going to put a guy in charge of the FDA who came from Peter Thiel land? And the reason he wanted the job running the FDA is because he believed that we could all become immortal. <laughs> or at least some of us could. And he was working on that, so that's why he wanted to run the FDA. Right? This guy at the National Security Council is from the same CRISPR drawer in the same fridge. And he is still there. And Dina Powell is leaving. As Dina Powell leaves, the person left running strategy at the National Security Council is somebody who believes that the end is nigh and only Putin can save us. And this is like 
point thirty four that we learned today out of about a hundred new pieces of information that the Washington broke with this big new story. According to the Post today in this remarkable story by Greg Miller, Greg Jaffe and Philip Rucker, there's an important national security story to tell about the consequences of Trump refusing to admit to or grapple with in any meaningful way the fact that Russia interfered meaningfully in the election that made him president. Quote, the result is without obvious parallel in U.S. history, a situation in which the personal insecurities of the president, his refusal to accept what even many in his administration regard as objective reality, has impaired the government's response to a national security threat. According to the Post's reporting, these are just some of the other important pieces of news they broke today. According to the Post today, the, the president's daily intelligence brief is structured by his briefers to avoid upsetting him with any information he might not, he might not like to hear about Russia. And I have to say, this is a piece of reporting that raises troubling concerns about whether or not the president actually reads, um, whether he reads his intelligence briefings. Quote, a former senior intelligence official familiar with the matter says Russia-related intelligence that might draw Trump's ire is in some cases included only in the written assessment and not raised orally. Well, because then you can be sure he won't see it because it's written? <clears throat> the Post also in this new piece today describes an extraordinary, uh, what they call an extraordinary CIA stream of intelligence that had captured Putin's specific instructions on the operation to attack our election last year. The stream of post-election intelligence um, about Putin apparently has given the intelligence community information that Putin believes the operation to go after our election last year was, quote, more than worth the effort. That would suggest that Russia will keep trying to do more of it. But the Post also reports that Trump has never convened a cabinet-level meeting on Russian interference or what to do about it. In terms of the National Security Council, quote, one former high-ranking Trump administration official said there is an unspoken understanding within the NSC that to raise the matter of Russia is to acknowledge its validity, which the president would see as an affront. After the new National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster, brought in a legit Russia expert to helm that part of the National Security Council, Fiona Hill, Trump demeaned and insulted her in a way that is almost hard to believe, even for what we know about this president and his White House. Quote, in one of her first encounters with the president, an Oval Office meeting in preparation for a call with Putin on Syria, Trump appeared to mistake Fiona Hill for a member of the clerical staff, handing her a memo he had marked up and instructing her to rewrite it. When Hill responded with a perplexed look, Trump became irritated with what he interpreted as insubordination, according to officials who witnessed the exchange. As she walked away in confusion, Trump exploded and motioned for McMaster to intervene. McMaster then followed Fiona Hill out the door and scolded her. Fiona Hill is the Russia expert on the National Security Council, a legit Russia expert who was brought into the National Security Council post the Flynn and Bannon debacle just remarkable. We've got Greg Miller here to talk about some of this uh, remarkable reporting, including um, the damning and brand new revelation that even after the Trump administration got caught planning to unilaterally lift sanctions on Russia and Congress got alerted to that fact and blocked them from doing it, even after those efforts were exposed by Congress and exposed in the press and became a subject of great scandal and great consternation in Washington, even after all that, the administration and specifically Secretary of State Rex Tillerson reportedly continued to offer the Russians in secret that the Trump administrations would help them out on sanctions. That they were happy to give them back some of what Obama had taken away in punishment for them hacking our election. Just remarkable, remarkable reporting today from The Washington Post. Greg Miller joins us next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.